Let's just get started. We're not gonna start with the lecture, but a few pieces of information. Uh, Chris has done an awesome job in, in uh, sort of formatting all the videos. And while they haven't been technically edited and we haven't polished them or anything like that, they are now online. So this is lecture one going on down to to the last lecture, okay? And it's a good thing the last lecture was there because I realized I had made a mistake and I wanted to correct that before we went too far. Uh, when I was talking about, oh, so yeah, cool with this? Yeah, makes sense. So basically all this is is a YouTube clip. So clip onto the YouTube and you can play with the size and stuff like that. You can actually enlarge it, which might actually be better than trying to look at it at such a small scale. But you can also refine the, uh, the load speed. So uh, if you have, I mean, my, my computer, this computer, for example, can't take the high definition or it's just going to stall totally. We tried it yesterday with my phone. It didn't work too well. So bring down the bandwidth significantly on your computers if you have to, okay? Um, but interestingly enough, yesterday as I was watching the last one, I realized that I had been misspoke, misspeaking about this equation. This is a rate equation, and I was making it as a mass equation. This is a rate equation. So this delta x at the end here, I know, let's put this into, uh, Slide show, there it is. Um, this delta x at the end is not, a, is not a delta x as in distance. This is a delta x as in time. This is a rate equation. So, uh, so infiltration rate is hydraulic condu conductivity, so the nature of that soil media, times the changes in the potentials over a time, time scale, time domain. Okay? We cool with that one? Sorry about that. It was a good thing I have a video, though. You guys went. All right, so uh, where we stopped, nobody knows, is basically right there. So are there any questions about infiltration? Because we're going to move on now to subsurface flow. And when we start talking about subsurface flow, we're going to be talking about two sort of processes. But are we pretty cool with infiltration at this point? All right, so let's start talking about subsurface flow. And if we talk about subsurface flow, we're basically talking about two conditions. One is a saturated condition versus an unsaturated condition. Okay, so let's start the lecture with the sponge again. Okay, no, no water this time. We're all going to do it in our heads. Okay, now the sponge is fairly dry at this point. I can squeeze. There's no water in here anymore. But let's imagine that this, this sponge is bone dry. Okay, it's totally dry. I start adding water to it. Okay, what is going to happen to that water? Well, it's going to get wet. Okay, the sponge is going to get wet. Okay, and the sponge is going to hold water. It's got a certain capacity to hold that water. And that capacity is what we, is based on the matrix potential, but it's based on the surface areas that are here. Anything that has a surface has a capacity to hold on to things, to hold on to water. That's its matrix potential. The more surface area you have per volume, the more matrix potential you have. Okay, now, Last lecture, I basically made this sound like gravity is basically pushing things this way and matrix potential is basically sucking things up. But the reality is, I, when I talked about this on, on, um, on Monday, and I said, well, if I added water over here, what would happen to the water? Okay. Well, the well, water is going to migrate this way. Because what's going to happen is, as I pour the water here, that matrix potential, that suction ability, is going to start getting satisfied. But over here, it's pretty dry. Okay, so this is going to have more matrix potential than this, more negative than this, which means the water, when it comes in through here, as the matrix potential in here gets reduced because it's being satisfied by water, the attraction or the suction by this water is going to drive the water this way. Does that make sense? Right? Are we good with that? Okay. Now, once this system is saturated, the flow dynamics are going to change. Okay? You remember when I did this, right? I started here and then I went like this. Okay? Well, by doing this, I'm creating, I'm increasing the head, the distance of the waterfall, right? Okay? So once this system gets saturated, it's going to start getting driven by gravitational potential. Okay? And what we're going to talk about first is this gravitational flow, how the water is flowing in these systems when they're saturated, when all the matrix potential is basically satisfied. Okay, 
So, saturated flow occurs when all the pores are water filled, makes sense. Okay, it's more rapid in large pores versus small pores. I think I beat that pretty heavily on Monday. Okay, and it's gonna flow in response to these gradients, these potential gradients. Okay, now it's primarily gravitational, but we also talked about pressure potential. Okay, but it's gonna move based on these gradients from zero reference to the high. Okay, well, it's actually the inverse of it, but um, high pressure is gonna be flowing towards my reference point. Okay, so gravity. Okay, but pressure can be a lot of different directions, but it's always gonna be moving towards that reference point. Okay, and the reference point is an arbitrary point that you, you're interested in. The bottom of my pot, the bottom of my well, the rooting depth. Does that make sense? Okay. That makes sense already. All right, so does this table graphic make more sense now? High flow towards your reference point. Gravitational pull, pulling this towards that reference point. All right, let's move on to unsaturated flow, because unsaturated flow is a little bit more complicated. Okay? It is much more common than saturated flow. Does that make sense to everybody? If you think about it, it rains, yes, the soils get saturated, but more often than not, they are not saturated. So the water dynamics, the water flow in those systems is, is going to be predominantly unsaturated flow. Okay? Now, whether that makes it more important or not, that's sort of an interesting question. I'm not sure if we can really answer that. But it's controlled by the matrix potential, and it's movement from areas of less negative potential to more negative potential. More negative potential has more suction. Makes sense. Here's sort of the classic example. This is right out of your book, but I mean, you can, I can draw a picture of this. I have a video of this. But basically, this is a classic example. The capillary, capillary rise is basically driven by this matrix potential. Okay? Up here, because there's no water, there's more matrix potential than down here because there is water. Now, the question is, is there enough matrix potential up here to be able to pull the water all the way up? Now, when I have large pipes, no. I don't have enough matrix potential. But as those pipes get smaller, the matrix potential becomes more negative, and it can counteract the gravitational pull on that water and basically use capillary action or adhesion cohesion properties of water to basically move that water column up. Now, does that make sense? We understand capillary action, and now we can relate it to the matrix potential of the material. This is why capillary action goes higher in smaller materials. Okay, it's the attraction of that surface area. And the more surface area you have, the more attraction. All right, so, I mean, I've showed you this slide before, coarse sand versus fine sand, but take home message from this is, you know, the, the smaller the pores, the more surface area you have, the higher it's gonna go. But that doesn't actually talk anything about how fast it's gonna go. So let's take a look at this slide. Now this slide is time, time domain right here is in days. And this is the rise, the capillary rise. And each one of these lines represents a different texture. Okay? Coarse texture, less coarse texture, finest of the textures. Now as you look here, you can notice that the rise in the sand is the fastest compared to the clay. Give it six or eight days, we start seeing the loamy sands start approaching, and then you get up to these really fine ones, and the capillary rise is really high. But it takes a while to get there. Why? What's happening? This is just like infiltration. It has something to do with the nature of those pores. The actual <coughs> distance traveled, the actual distance traveled is the surfaces not the actual height of the water column. Okay? If I have clay, the water is going to rise like, uh, if I have sand, the water is going to rise like this. Right? It's, it's a little wavy, but if I'm a clay, the surface is going to rise like this. So the actual distance traveled by that water 
is a lot farther. Does that make sense? Let's draw this. Here's my sand rise. Now here's a grain of sand, here's a grain of sand, here's a grain of sand. Okay, so the distance traveled, the absolute distance traveled is, is the relative distance traveled is this. The absolute distance traveled is this plus this domain right here, right? Clay, on the other hand, it's doing this all the way up, right? And it gets to about here, and it's traveled actually about the same distance as this is. Its absolute distance is about the same. Its relative distance is dramatically different. Now I give it time, and that relative difference is going to get way up here, and it's going to keep going. So two things that are going on here. You have to think about what the absolute height is and actually how fast it's going to get there. Cool? All right. Next thing. OK, so we've got, we've got how fast it is and how high it's going to rise. Let's actually talk about the incipient condition of the soil. OK, let's go back to this sponge. OK, I'm going to add water to a system, and I'm only going to add a certain amount. And then we're going to watch the water migrate. OK, so I'm going to add a certain amount of water here and see how long it takes to get to here. OK, now the drier this zone is when I start, the longer it is going to take for the water to migrate from here to here. Does that make sense? The less water I have here, the more negative the matrix potential. Granted, this has a more negative matrix potential. But the less water I have here relative to the amounts of water I put in here, like three different events, and let's imagine this. Here's the days of contact. Here's time. And here's the water penetration from the moist soil to the dry soil. Moist soil in this case, I started at 15%. Moist soil in this case, I started at 29%. Wetter soil at 29, it's going to travel faster and certainly farther. Does that make sense to everybody? Go. So the question was, is the moisture level for the whole sponge or the, just the part you're adding it to? This, in this scenario, the, the, the consideration is the moisture is just for the spot that I've wetted, and then we're watching it move to the dry. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, so if I start in this scenario, I have basically 16% moisture content. At this end, this end. This end is dry. Moist soil initially. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. OK. Cool? Is there a limit to that? Like, is there a limit to, like, if the soil was at, you know, is there a, if, if so if that end was saturated. And this was totally dry? That was totally dry. This would move a lot faster and a lot far. I mean, it would be like capillary. OK. So the, so the question is, is there a limit to this? So if this was saturated at this end, am I, I'm, it's going to just move faster to this. Because the matrix potential here is less than this, which is less than this, which is less than this. Cool? OK, so that's four things you actually have to think about when you're talking about this unsaturated flow. First is you have to think about the, the absolute matrix potential back to here. OK, so the size of the pores. Then you have to think about how fast it's really going to be moving. You know, yeah, it's going to be moving fast, but it's not going to go far. <laughs> and then you have to think about what's the incipient conditions in your media for movement. Cool? OK. Which comes back to this slide. Now, does this slide make more sense? OK, we have a wedding front, an hour wedding front, and a three hour wedding front. Granted, this is we're looking at mass flow. And in the real world, we have preferential flows and all different other kinds of things that are going on. But imagine this is just mass flow. Okay? Here's the theta, water content, and here's the depth, from 0 down to depth. Okay? You have the water moving through the system. I have a rain event. Okay? It gets the top part of the soils wet. Now imagine that rain stops. What's going to happen to that water?
So instead of having a wet soil, dry soil, I now have a wet soil, dry soil. The wet soil, less matrix potential. The dry soil, more matrix potential, more negative. That water, without, for, forget about gravitational pull, that water is going to be sucked down into this more negative matrix potential. Now, I literally could turn this on end. This is the wet spot. This is the dry spot. And that's this slide right here, right here. Cool? All right. The other thing I noticed by watching the videos is that I'm really beating the dead horse over and over again, so I apologize. Um, if you guys have questions, just raise your hands as usual. I, I'm going to try not to drive you guys crazy. OK. See? Question. See? So, Go. <laughs> um, with the, <coughs> sorry, with the um, water moving up to the drier spot, which end has more or less matrix potential? When, when it equilibrates, everything's going to have the same. But when it starts, if this is the wet spot, or this is the wet spot, or this is the wet spot, this has the more negative. Okay. So it has more. So it's a bigger negative number. Right. So if we go back to you know, this table that everybody hates, or this graph here, more is this way, more is that way. Okay. okay so more negative is this way. So I, if I have more matrix potential than another location, I'm, I'm meaning this way relative to here. OK, go. And what, so what is the wet side? So the wet side, in this, uh, in this case, would have less negative well, matrix the potential. The, the dry negative. would have more. So the, if I put this, this is the wet side, it would look like that. Okay. Does that make sense to the wet side, the dry side? OK, so this is pulling the water this way. And so you're going to equilibrate someplace in the middle. Okay. And ultimately, the whole sponge is going to be this, have the same matrix potential. Go. So the greater the negative matrix potential, the slower the water moves through the source? No. The greater the negative matrix potential, the, the more attractiveness it is. The movement actually has to do with the texture, with the, the pathways themselves. But the absolute movement has to do with the matrix potential, the force of that pull. Does that make sense? So the question was, say, say the question. So the matrix, the matrix potential doesn't actually have anything. It, it does a little bit. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the speed of the pull over the absolute pull. Okay, So the texture is going to drive how fast things move because you're going to have the, the, the pathways. I mean, if I have a clay, it's going to be going like this. If I have a sand, it's going to be going like this. So the dis the absolute, the act, the, not the absolute, the relative distance traveled is going to be based on the texture. The absolute distance is basically going to be based on the matrix potential. Does that make sense to everybody? This one I actually do need a yes or no. And the bigger the difference yeah. between the matrix potential, the faster it will move? The bigger the difference between the matrix potential, the faster it will move. Okay. But it's. But that's relative. If, if this is sand, and this is sand, and this is sand, right, it's relative, yeah, relative to texture. Cool? Go. The, the stuff you're showing about the antecedent moisture conditions, is that because the matrix potential is different? Is, like, is that related to matrix potential differences as well? Because the moisture, like so the, you have a moisture soil, there's a greater difference between that. One's moist, yeah. So, so the question is, you know, it, it is, is, is the movement based more on the matrix potential than conditions in the soil? Well, the conditions in the soil basically control the matrix potential. So the answer is yes and yes. It doesn't seem that way. But if, if my, my the, the conditions that are here on, in my soil, OK, and this side happens to be we might have drip irrigation or a rain event. Or more importantly, let's set it this way. I have transpiration up here. The plant's drying this part of the soil out. OK, that is creating more negative matrix potential here. And that's going to start migrating the, the less negative matrix potential here upwards. Does that make sense? 
So yes, it does have to do with what the conditions are in the soil, but it also that those conditions are basically driving the matrix potential. So the answer in your case would be yes, it's the matrix potential, but yes, it's also the conditions in the soil. Cool? All right. All right, so what does this actually mean in the real world? So let's just show sort of, sort of a graphic here. Okay, you can sort of, so here's my clay surface, but basically what you're looking at is as you are closer to this surface, you are stronger and strongly attracted. So imagine as this system gets drier and drier and drier, the water is going to get strong, more and more held, more and more held, more and more strongly held by that soil surface. Okay, and as it gets wetted up, it's going to get less and less and less strongly held. Cool? All right. Uh, you saw this, saw this, we skipped this, skipped this. All right, all right. So we've been talking about movement, okay? And if we're talking about movement and that movement is basically driven by this matrix potential, matrix potential basically drawing something in and pulling it and holding it in place, we really should start talking about storage, okay? It's not just the soil moving, the, the, the soil water moving, but it's also being held in place. And so that brings up two questions. One is, how much water am I actually storing in a given location? And two is, how in fact is that, store, that storage of water being accessed? Or how do you access it? OK? So the soil matrix basically holds that water against the pull of gravity. This is controlled by the matrix potential and is a function of capillarity and absorption. OK, capillary is the importance in wet soils. Absorption is important when the soils become below field capacity. Okay? This is capillary as well, but new term, field capacity. Field capacity is the point at which a soil, and I'll, I'll get a couple graphs on this, but it's the point at which a soil can hold water against gravity. It's the maximum amount of water a given soil can hold against gravity. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, here's sort of the, why am I missing a slide here? All right, let's go through this one. All right, so here's my volumetric content. Okay, so this is theta, right? So theta is the amount of water that's in, that po in the pore spaces from zero to about 50%. A little bit more, a little bit less, depending on what kind of text you are. Okay, this is the potential, how much Maybe you could say sort of matrix potential and gravitational potential is in that soil. Okay, how much drive there is in this soil to move. Okay, in this case, we're basically going to be looking at sort of matrix potential, the amount of drive there is to actually hold that water. Okay, so I've got a clay, I've got a loam, I've got a sand. Okay, at low pressure potential, so, so imagine this that reference point of zero. Okay, at low pressure, low suction. The water, I mean, imagine my soil's in a vacuum, no gravity, no, not a vacuum, in gra no gravity. Okay, this is the maximum amount, this point right here, soil water potential, this is the maximum amount that soil can hold, saturated condition. Now, as water starts being pulled out of that system, initially due to gravity, okay, it's going to start, the potential, the matrix potential of that soil is going to become more negative. Now this is red, there's basically two scales here. One is bars and one is kilopascals, okay? Bars to the top, kilopascals down here, okay? But this is basically a measurement of the negative pressure. It's a pseudo measurement for matrix potential, okay? It's suction. As the water content comes out of these soils, the water is being held tighter and tighter by the soil. Okay, so when this theta starts coming down, as you move farther and farther this way, you can notice that the negative pressure becomes more and more and more. Right? So our soils are drying and the water is being held tighter. There's basically three stages of this curve. Okay, the first stage is right here, 
and this box represents a volume, okay? Part of that volume, volume solid, volume water, volume air. A little spot of air here, but basically the soil is saturated, okay? Now, as that volume of water decreases, see, is it going down? Oops, the wrong way. As that volume of water decreases this way, the pressure, the negative pressure is increasing. The maximum point, this is the field capacity again, the maximum point or the maximum amount of water that can be stored or held in this volume of soil against gravity is field capacity. Okay? Now, we get to field capacity, there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, a lot of demands being put upon that water. We've got plants growing in there. We've got organisms growing in there. They're going to start using that water. Okay? And if they start using that water, they're going to start drawing down the volume of water. Okay? Sooner or later, it's going to get down to <coughs> levels around here. Okay? It's going to get to a point that the plants can no longer extract it. They cannot pull the water against the matrix potential. The matrix potential is just holding the water so tightly that the roots, the plant roots, can't get it anymore. We call that the wilting point. Make sense? Now, there is still water in this soil. The plants just can't get to it. Field capacity, wilting point. Now, if there is still water in this soil, we basically can throw it in an oven, right, and raise the temperature to 200 Celsius, or 100 Celsius, okay, 100 Celsius boiling point, right, okay? I can basically boil off the water, at which point I have the solid particle, the airspace, but there's no water. This is basically the reference point. We call this oven dry. It's the reference point for the weight of the soil. We're weighing the soil. We're not weighing the water that's in the soil. Okay? At that point, you're down here. No water. Cool? Let's look at this a little bit differently. And look at this curve. Okay? So here's my theta again. This could be any kind of soil, but I'm looking up here. It's probably a fairly finer soil, probably a silt loam. Okay? This green line here represents how much water is in the soil. Okay? So as the theta goes down, as it comes down, this is basically the gravitational water. This is the water that's the max, the saturated soil, but this is the water that's going to get pulled out of the soil from here to here based on gravity. At which point I'm at field capacity. I then have a slew of water from here to here, from here to here, that's available water. This is the water that's available for the plants. At which point I'm getting to the wilting point? Plants can't get it anymore. I'm about 15 bar, 1,500 kilopascals. From here on, down to this point, when we get here, that's the oven dry. Fairly interesting? OK. These two points. Now this is a silt loam. Let's look at a lot of different types of soils because the nature of the different types of soils are going to control both the gravitational pull and the matrix pull. Okay? This is a sandy soil at this end moving all the way to the clay. This is a measure of our theta. The green line here represents that field capacity point, this point right here. This green line, the wilting coefficient, is this point right here. Okay? Coarse soil doesn't have a lot of matrix potential. Make sense? All of this is the gravitational water. Up to the theta up there, we got 40, 40 percent. All of that is water that's going to drain out of this sand because of gravity. Right here, at about 8 percent, is the amount of water that sand can hold against gravity. Because it doesn't have a lot of surface areas, it doesn't ha have a lot of matrix potential. On the other hand, 
over here at the clay, very small amount of that water is going to be pulled out because of gravity. It's got a really high field capacity. It's got a lot of matrix potential, a lot of surface area. Now, the plants start breathing. They start respiring. They start sucking that water up. Evaporation starts happening, evapotranspiration, combination of the two of them. This available water is going to start getting drawn down. Back to the sand. There's not a lot of available water here. Well, first off, gravitational water, there's a lot of it. There's not very much available water in, in general. Okay? But you'll notice that this point, to the wilting point, not a lot of water. That's because there's not a lot of storage in there. The plants are going to get to a point, I'm going to suck up maybe 6%, 5% of water. This is why sands are so droughty. I'm going to hit this point pretty early. Clays, on the other hand, you get out here, there's a lot of water still in that clay. But the plants can't get it out because the matrix potential is so high. Now, the take home message of this slide is actually look at the pie piece or the chunk, the area of the available water. Where is it in fact maximum? Sitting someplace in here. Yeah, the clays can hold onto the water really well. And yeah, the sands are really well drained. But if you're interested in available water for your use or for the plant's use, it sits in here. Why? The loamy or the mixes. I have sand in there. I have silt. I have clay, which means I have larger pores, but I also have lots of small pores. I don't have the abundance of small pores as I would with the clay. So I still have a fairly large matrix potential to hold water against gravity. On the other hand, it's not so high that it's preventing the plants from being able to suck it off. Cool? Okay. Now, I've shown you this. I've actually draw, drawn, drawn this earlier. I guess it was last, on Monday. But basically, this is solute potential. I just want to review it real quickly. Because when we start talking about this water, so far we've been talking about it like it's pure water. But the reality is, this is not pure water. Okay? So we do, in fact, have to start talking about solute potential. Okay, the solute potential is that forces that pulls water across a membrane, like a root cell. And basically what we're looking at is salt concentration on one side, no salt on the other side. The salt concentration basically pulls the water across that membrane. And so you're looking at the osmotic potential here. Okay, the rise in the water on this side is based on that salt content. Imagine the inside of a root versus the outside of a root. Or a root uh, a cell. Okay. What's important about this is why is this working? Well, this ion, this sodium ion here, is basically acting like a soil surface. A surface. It's a polar, creating a, basically a polar attraction to the negative sides of these waters. The water's attracted to it. And if it's attracted to it, it's basically going to go right through that membrane and to be attracted. Does that make sense? It's going to be pulled across. Now. Why do I talk about that? Well, I talk about it because of a table like this. This is basically a chart of pure water composition. P not pure, poor water composition. Okay? There are a lot of different cations and anions, ions in this water. There's also organic compounds, dissolved materials. There's also dissolved gases, as well as suspended, suspended pl clay particles. This is what we saw at the arc ports. That water was moving clay particles down and creating those lamella BTs. Now, what controls this? What's going on in the landscape? The vegetation, the climate, biological activity, the soil mineralogy, the parent material itself, as well as time. Time, basically, I go back to my analogy, give me a weak acid and I'll weather away anything in a million years. You know, long time that's been there a long time, I'm going to have weathered a lot of material that's going to be in this soil solution. Okay? So as this water is being stored and as this water is moving, it's going to be moving all of these things with it. 
So understanding how the water is moving is also going to explain how the other things are moving well as well. OK, questions so far? Did I move too quickly through this, too slow? It's 9 o'clock. It's 9 9.39. You guys have survived. <laughs> OK, let's get a stop there. And what we're going to do is we're going to switch phases, and we're going to go to a video. It's like the, let's see, video. Now this video was uh, put together by the University of Arizona. Okay, and there's a couple things I want you to see here. The first is sort of the movement of water through pure clay, silts, and sands. And I'm going to sit over here and sort of pause it back and forth. Can you guys see this? Should we turn out a couple more lights? No? Yeah, I can see it. You can see it. I can see it. Pause it right there. OK. So these graphs are basically going to be, you're going to see a couple, basically these are pieces of glass with soil in between them. OK. And then they're going to be dripping water on the surface for a variety, in a different variety of different ways. In this case, it's a point source. But in some cases, it's going to be across the whole top. Along the bottom, you usually see a time. And sometimes across the side, you'll see a depth. OK. Basically, what you're seeing here is you're seeing clay, silts, and sands. And they're basically feeding water from the top. And we're basically seeing mass flow because they've basically, there's no imperfections in this. This is like pure stuff. OK. So I start adding, or they start adding water at the surface. What do you expect is going to happen? You're going to see a wetting front, and that wetting front's going to be moving based on the porosity of the material. OK? Coarse porosity, fine porosity. Right? So keep it flowing through. Pretty straightforward. Yeah? yeah. All right. We're going to fast forward through some of these. They'll do it a couple times. If anybody actually wants to see this video full, full on, come and borrow it from me. We'll see if we can get it online. Um, this is where you're looking at it from a center point moving outward. Da, 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 da. This is moving slowly. Let's see if I can pick it up. OK, so this is a diagram. This is basically showing unsaturated versus saturated flow. Back it up and play. Yep. So they're ponding at the surface. They're going to do it again. So what you're looking at at the front, this leading edge is unsaturated. But behind it, it's saturated flow. So the saturated water is moving through. And basically, you're seeing the matrix potential suck it out. And hence, you've got these nice round curves. The water is being delivered basically right here, yet you have a curve. So it's not just flowing down, it's also being sucked sideways. That makes sense, right? OK, now let's, this is sort of an artificial situ situation. I mean, you might find these in sand dunes where you have basically really nice sorting of material so that it's just like one type of, of size. OK, but let's start putting different materials in this. Let's fast forward this for a little bit. Come on. OK, let's start putting a barrier in here. So we've got clay, sand, clay. What do you guys think is going to happen? Let's pause this right here. What do you think is going to happen? It will flow down. <laughs> OK, so the water is going to hit here, and we're going to get that classic sort of curve, sort of half half circle. OK. What's going to happen when that half circle hits here? You think it's going to go through really fast? 
Remember the front end of this wedding front is due to matrix potential. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Clay driving through. Now it's moving through matrix potential. Above, behind it, it's saturated. But in the front end is matrix potential. It's going to hit here. Which has more matrix potential, here or here? The clay. So the water is basically going to stall here. Okay? Until the clay gets saturated, at which point the matrix potential is satisfied, and then the water is going to move into the sand. Make sense? Okay, water goes through the sand, hits this barrier. What's going to happen? This is a clay line right here. What's going to happen when it hits there? It's going to accelerate again because the matrix potential here is faster than here. So this side is going to suck it in. Let's see if that's, in fact, what happens. So you can sort of see that saturated zone up there. That's pretty impressive. Now, come on. There it goes. And then hits that bottom and gets sucked in. This, this is a classic example of what people do with their pots all the time. You guys ever put gravel at the bottom of your pots expecting it to increase drainage? Does it work? No, actually it basically reduces the amount of volume of your pot. That's all it does. Okay? All right. So, how about let's put keep playing here. Let's go fast through this. Sand over clay, what's going to happen? And water's going to hit that clay layer, what's going to happen? Get sucked right in, but it's going to get that clay layer to the sand, what's going to happen? It's going to stall until this gets saturated, at which point the sand matrix potential, however small it may be, is going to start sucking water in. It is getting sucked in. It's just moving very slowly, but right here's the line. The material. It's slowed down when it hit that clay. It's getting sucked in, but it's slowed down. Hold on, I'll back, we can back it up. See the speed, the time, look at the time on the bottom. So it's moving pretty fast here. It hits that. It slows down, it, but it is moving in. Go. Does matrix potential have more force than gravity potential? Yes and no. It depends on the conditions. Matrix has more potential, has more force than gravity when it's drier, but as that matrix potential gets satisfied, it loses its, its strength and then gravity will take over. So it's a relative sort of condition. Does that make sense? Question? Yeah. Can you explain a little bit why, why would clay have more matrix potential? Well, clay has more. OK, let's go back to that. Let me pause this. Right there. OK, that's where we're going to start our next thing. Anyway, OK, so the question is, why does, matrix potential, uh, why does clay have more matrix potential than sand? Well, imagine that volume again. If I have a given volume of sand versus a given volume of clay, which is going to have more surface area? The clay. And if I have more surface area, I have more areas that can be attractive to the water. So the clay is going to have more, more when I say more, more, I mean more negative. Right? So I'm going to have more negative potential the finer my textures are, or the more surface areas I have per volume. Go. Yes, the, the, 
the relative speed of movement in the sand over the clays. No, 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 no. The absolute distance. So the absolute distance that traveled in both of them is actually the same. But the relative distance is different. Okay, because remember the sand is only traveling like this. The clay is doing this. They're basically traveling the same distance if it's due to matrix potential. Yeah. Okay, it's just the surface, that, I mean the route that they're taking is one's taking the local route and one's taking the express. That's a terrible analogy, but does that make sense? Okay, yeah? Okay, so let's move on. Let's, let's take a look at what happens when we have a break in this system. Okay, so sand over, or clay, sands over clays, what's going to happen? It's going to go right through the center of it. Does that make sense? The clay is sucking it in, but it's just going right through it. <laughs> uh, I went too far. Sorry. Uh, stop playing with the controls. OK, we got a system here where we have a pore that's open all the way to the surface, sand. This is clay, sand. OK, what's going to happen? Basically a large preferential flow pipe, right? Big pores, pipe. OK, hits this one though, what's going to happen? We saw this before. It's going to basically go right around it because the matrix potential here is greater than the matrix potential here. This is not open. This is gravitational pull basically going right through it. This, the only movement from here to here is through matrix potential until that side gets saturated. And then it becomes gravitational pull in. Poor. So the only reason it's flowing through the sand faster is because it's touching the surface? It's moving through the sand faster because this is that highway versus the local route. It's got a lot bigger pores, and gravitational pull is pulling it through. Okay, here's straw. So basically, look at a tillage operation. If your tillage operation puts the stuff subsurface and covers it, versus leaving the open pores, and this is a lot more reasonable. This is more about I know reasonable. This is a lot more real world. Okay, these soils are not going to be pure media. So you start talking to the people up at BEE, and they start talking about preferential flow. That's why they're talking about it. This is why. This water's going to preferentially go down those cracks. Now, if the crack doesn't happen to be open all the way to the surface, it's basically going to act like this and basically be a barrier until the soil above it becomes saturated, at which point it will move in to the zone that has less matrix potential than the zone around it. Okay, now there's one more thing I want to show you here. And actually, it's right up on it. Okay, this guy is throwing chemicals in the soil. And remember me talking about the soil water is not pure water, it's got all different kinds of stuff in it. So let's do a media and we'll show, we'll put little dye spots in it. And we can actually see the direction this water is flowing. Okay, in this case, it's just going to be dye, but imagine it's a pesticide or your fertilizer or whatever. Each one of these dots is a water soluble dot. Okay, we're going to put the water in two spots. Imagine this is your row. Okay, it's my corn row, my hill. Water moving in, mass flow. <clears throat> what direction does the dye go? Keep it going a little bit more. So each one of these dots, if you watch the dye, you can basically see the direction that the water's flowing. Interestingly enough, look at this spot right here. It's not moving, but you look at the spots above it and to the side of it, this is actually flowing that way. These guys up here are actually flowing up. 
So they're bringing the nutrients up with them, or, in this, or the dye in this case. But that certainly could be a pesticide or anything else, any other kind of chemical. Now sooner or later, I don't remember if they go through the whole, they saturate this system. But sooner or later, when this flow dynamic changes and starts moving this way, all of these patterns are basically going to start going down and they're basically lost from the system. Now this is a pure media, but imagine I had a clay lens here or a sand lens. What's going to happen? It could create perching conditions or stalling conditions. And no. Oh, yeah, here it is. Same dye system. This could be a plow pan, this could be a BT horizon, this could be a sand lens. So looking at what's happening here, finer texture, coarser texture. Make sense? It's perching. Water flow, saturation starting to get in. Speed it up a little bit. And they show how it's coming up at the top. Now imagine this is salts. Where are the salts going to be going? Right up to the surface. OK, am I beating the dead horse together at this point? All right. OK, let's paw. We'll stop here. OK, questions? Do we feel fairly comfortable with this? We are going to be reviewing this a little bit later when we start talking about nutrient cycles. So we're going to come back to this. But no questions? OK, guys, have a great day. Uh, Wednesday lab, it promised to be a lot drier today than yesterday. But otherwise, be free. <laughs>